Homework 8. Uh, most of the questions in this homework are about uh, ionic and covalent bonding, um, so let's have a go. Carbon bonds to oxygen to form carbon dioxide. What type of bonding is this? Okay, so uh, what you have to do to decide on the type of bonding is identify whether the elements are metals or non-metals in the substance. If there is a metal and non-metal, metal and non-metal, that is ionic bonding, okay? Because the metal gives an electron to the non-metal, the metal becomes positively charged, and the non-metal becomes negatively charged, and they stick together. Uh, if the elements are non-metal and non-metal, then the bonding is covalent. It's like covalent because uh, the non-metals share pairs of electrons. So that's the very definition of a covalent bond, a shared pair of electrons. Now, in covalent, there are... that Well, that forms a molecule to start with. That's a molecule. And molecules are not charged. Okay, so that's the difference between ionic and covalent. So an ionic bond is made from a metal and a non-metal. Uh, it forms a positive metal ion. So we have the word ions here. Uh, the metal forms a positive metal ion, the non-metal forms a, a negative metal ion by gaining that electron and they, they attract. That's ionic. Covalent, two non-metals sharing a pair of electrons and that forms a molecule that is not charged. So for this question here, ask yourself, is carbon a metal or a non-metal? Ask yourself, is oxygen a metal or a non-metal? Uh, look on the periodic table if you're not sure. We have a periodic table here. Uh, and the metals are on the left-hand side of this diagonal line down here. So anything this side is a metal, anything this side is a non-metal. And there, for example, is oxygen. So oxygen is a non-metal. So you need to find carbon on this periodic table and decide whether it's metal or non-metal. If it's a uh, covalent bond, we're talking about shared pairs of electrons. If we're talking, if it's an ionic bond, we're talking about donating and accepting electrons, forming charged ions that attract. What's the electronic configuration of oxygen? Well, I'll do the electronic configuration of nitrogen for you. Okay, uh, nitrogen uh, is there. It's got an atomic number of seven, so it's the bottom number that tells us the number of protons in the nucleus and therefore the number of electrons. In nitrogen, the number was the, the uh, atomic number was seven, so we're looking at that bottom number. So it's two on the first shell and five on the second shell. You can do it for oxygen. Draw a dot and cross diagram for a molecule of carbon dioxide. Well, carbon, if you look at it, has an atomic number of six, and oxygen has got an atomic number of eight. It tells you to show the outer electrons only, so we don't need to draw the first shell. So carbon, for example, there's carbon. Um, dot for the nucleus, not showing the first shell, but there'll be two electrons on the first shell. That would mean four more. So we'll have one, two, three, four. Now that's got four electrons on its outer shell. It's going to bond with oxygen, that's a non-metal. So that's going to be a covalent bond. So uh, we're looking at sharing pairs of electrons. Now the number of electrons it needs to fill its outer shell is the number of bonds it will form. So this needs four more electrons, so it's going to form four bonds. Now carbon dioxide's got the formula CO2. So it's going to bond with two oxygen atoms. Therefore, it's going to need to form two bonds with each oxygen. So let's draw the outer shell of oxygen over those two electrons now. Now oxygen's got an atomic number of eight, two on the first shell, dot for the nucleus, two on the first shell, so six more. Now covalent bond is a shared pair, so there's gonna to have to be two of oxygen's electrons. Let's put two of oxygen's electrons in that overlap as well, so we are sharing pairs. That's two of the six outer electrons. Remember, two on the first shell, that's going to be three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we look at this oxygen now, this oxygen is happy. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. 
Look at this carbon now. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six. This carbon is not happy, but we do have to draw another oxygen. Now I'm going to leave you to draw that last oxygen and put those last electrons on. Does carbon dioxide have a high or low boiling point? Well, carbon dioxide is a molecule, um, so uh, melting points and boiling points uh, are low. I'll help you with that one. I'll, I'll tell you that's low. Now, if we were to draw uh, a box with carbon dioxide molecules in it, okay, you'd have a carbon dioxide molecule there, and you'd have a carbon dioxide molecule there, and a few more. They'll be spaced out. It's a gas, basically. So the particles are spaced out. Now, if you're tempted to say the melting points and the boiling points are low because the covalent bond is weak, that's rubbish. Okay, That covalent bond there, that's a double covalent bond to be honest because it's got two shared pairs, double covalent bond. That double covalent bond there is strong. Okay, so it might, it might sound nice to say the boiling point is low because the covalent bond is weak, so the atoms are easily separated. Um, might make a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense, but it's wrong. Okay, so if that covalent bond isn't uh, weak, what is weak? Well, there's nothing holding those two molecules together. So we'd, we'd call that there a intermolecular force of attraction. So I think you should get that phrase into that answer. Next question. Um, antimony is made of two naturally occurring isotopes. Antimony uh, 121, 57%, uh, and antimony with a mass number of 123, 43%. Calculate the relative atomic mass of antimony. I've done three or four of these questions in homeworks uh, up until this point, so I will just give you the first bit uh, of the formula to work it out. Uh, mass times uh, abundance, percentage abundance. Um, okay, so I've just given you the first bit of the formula, mass times percentage abundance. Okay, so the mass here is antimony 121, the percentage is 57. Um, and you are going to have to write the rest of the formula out uh, and then put the numbers in and work it. I'm not going to give you any more help than that. Uh, but if you do need more help, then watch one of the previous homeworks with one of these questions because I've spent more time on it. What charge would the magnesium ion form? So there's a couple of ways you can work that out. Um, we're either looking at its electronic configuration and working out whether it gains or loses electrons or how many. Uh, or um, you, if you're good at reading the periodic table um, by just simply knowing the group of the periodic table uh, that an element is in, it tells you uh, the charge uh, that that element forms when it forms an ion. So um, let's start here in group one. Everything in group one has got one electron in its outer shell, so it forms a one plus charge. Every ion in that group forms a one plus charge, because they've all got one electron, they lose one electron, hence one plus. Everything in group two has got two electrons in the outer shell, so they form two plus charges. Okay, uh, these ones down here, this is a transition metals. Now these metals can form ions of different charge. So for example, if you look at iron, when, when you see iron written in a compound, it often has iron two or iron three after it as Roman numerals, or even iron uh, six, uh, maybe. Um, so whatever the Roman numeral is, that tells us the charge in the ions. So Fe2 like that is Fe2+, uh, plus. Fe3 like that is Fe3+. Plus. Okay, so uh, we have to have that Roman numeral. Without that, we have no idea for these. Everything in group three has got three electrons in the outer shell, so they form a three plus ion. Um, coming back the other way now. Um, everything in group zero has got fill-out shells, so doesn't form ions. No ions for group zero. Uh, everything in group seven has got seven electrons in the outer shell, so they form a single minus ion when they form uh, ions. Everything in group six uh, forms a two minus ion. Everything in group five forms a three minus ion. Everything in group four bonds covalently because they neither gain four nor lose four. Um, so they bond to covalently, so they don't form ions. So that the period table helps us with the charges and ions. So find magnesium. Either draw out the electronic configuration and work it out, or look at what, uh, uh, what group it's on the periodic table. Next one, are magnesium carbonates and magnesium nitrate examples of ionic covalent bonding? Well, the help for that 
is back up to the top here. Uh, does it contain a metal and a non-metal of these compounds? If so, it's ionic. Uh, if it contains um, two or more non-metals chemically combined, it's covalent. So uh, have a look at the periodic table and you can answer that. Next one. Magnesium carbonate is insoluble in water, whereas magnesium nitrate is soluble. So we've got solubility rules we can learn to help us with that. Uh, explain what difference, if any, there is in the ability of these substances when mixed with water to conduct electricity. Okay, so uh, this is about uh, electrical conductivity. Now, ionic substances, when they are molten, they will conduct. When they are solid, they will not. Covalent substances are poor conductors of electricity all the time. So the first thing is to decide whether these, of course, are ionic or covalent, and you did that in the previous question. After that, it's essential you know what a current of electricity is. So that's, I never tire of telling students this because it's absolutely essential to be able to answer these questions. A current uh, of electricity uh, is a flow of charged particles. Now those particles can be either one electrons and that's why metals conduct, because they've got delocalised electrons, or two ions. An ion is a charged atom. Now, if they can move, they conduct. Okay, if they can't move, they don't conduct. And that's why, for ionic substances, if they are solid, they don't conduct, because the ions are locked in the ionic lattice. The ionic lattice is a, is a grid where the ions are held in place and don't move by their opposite charges. So solid ionic substances do not conduct because the ions cannot move. Um, molten or liquid or dissolved ionic substances will conduct because the ions, when in liquid state, the particles are free to move. Ionic substances do not have any free electrons. That's not true. Ionic substances conduct in liquid state because the ions can move. Covalent substances, the molecules are not charged, so they don't conduct. Uh, and they don't have any free electrons because they're all used in bonding. So covalent substances are poor conductors for that reason. And that's quite helpful when answering this next question as well. What type of bonding is present within water? Well, what's the form of water? Are they metals or non-metals? Is water a good or a poor conductor of electricity? Well, once you've decided the type of bonding, then hopefully... Uh, if you just listen to what I've said about uh, ionic and covalent substances up here for this, that should help as well. Good luck.